Well, the Democrats don't want to do debates. Uh, I know Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr. want to debate. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I, I understand why he doesn't want to do it. I mean, I, I truly understand why he doesn't want to do it. But they are, you know, there's a big difference. Although, uh, in the case of RFK, I've seen polls where he's at 20 percent. That's not bad. But I understand why he doesn't want to do that. Look, when you're running for office and you have, in his case, let's say he has a 30 or 40 point lead, why would he do it? Now, uh, people are going to say, well, he can't do it. I actually think he can't do it if you want to know the truth. I don't think he's capable of doing it. But why would he do it, especially because of that? Why would he do it? If he's got a 30 or 40 point lead, which is what he's got, uh, I mean, I don't think RFK expects that he's going to be debating. He's a very smart guy, by the way. I don't think he expects to be debating Biden. You've spent time with him, RFK. Tell me about I him. I have. He, is he a formidable com competitor? He's a very smart person, yeah. I know a lot of the members of that family, and, you know, he's a very smart guy. And. Uh, he's hit a little bit of a nerve. I think he really has. And a lot of Democrats I know want to vote for him. But again, if he's at 20 percent and if uh, Biden has a big lead, number one, Biden can't debate him because he's not capable. And number two, why would he debate him for that reason? But also, why would he debate him if he's probably got it locked up? I don't see RFK Jr. I don't see him getting the nomination under any circumstances. How do you feel about potentially running alongside Donald Trump? I want to run against Trump, and I, I can run against Trump better than anybody else can. Do you think you could win? I know I can win because I can hold it because I get, you know, uh, I get many of the same supporters. I will take support from Pre President Trump. Nobody, no other Democrat can do that. My supporters are probably equally Republican and Democrat at this point, and I get more independent voters than anybody. And I can confront President Trump with the lockdowns, which no Democrat can. Lockdowns, he closed 3.3 million businesses. He closed 41% of the black-owned businesses in our country would never reopen again. This is a war on the poor. It was a war on minorities. It was the destruction of the middle class. Bobby Kennedy, he's getting, he's a Democrat from the first family, they used to call it, and he's taking almost as much heat as you are from fake news. What would you tell Bobby Kennedy? I just hang in. I mean, they go after he's been very nice to me. I've, I've actually had a very nice relationship with him over the years. He's a very smart guy and a good guy. He said, uh, Trump's the greatest debater and you can't just not debate and going against Trump. I was very honored by the fact that he said that. I'm glad he feels that, but he's a very, uh, he's a very good man. And he's, uh, his heart is in the right place, and he's doing really well. I said, Paul, he's at 22. That's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty good. Doing very well. So have you talked to him lately? No, I haven't. I would, but I haven't. Okay. Now, we have, there's a lot of things. You know, he's a common sense guy, and so am I. So whether you're conservative or liberal, uh, common sense is common sense. And uh, a lot of what I run on is common sense. You know, we need a wall, and we built most of it. But they didn't want to finish up the extra area. I wanted to do more after we got it built. I wanted to do more. But without that, we had the best numbers in the border, as you know, because you've said it many times. We yeah. had the best numbers in history. Yeah. And uh, now we have the worst numbers, I think, of any country ever in the world. Okay. Well, Mr. No country Pre would allow Mr. President, I know you got to run. So uh, we uh, welcome welcome you back to uh, New Hampshire and New England tomorrow, right. and uh, look forward to seeing right. you again. And uh, thank and you're welcome on the show anytime you want. And, you know, people have said to me, why don't you run it as an independent? Why don't you? And I say, because I'm a Democrat. This is who I am. This is my identity. But I want my party back. I want my party to be what my, the party that I grew up in, the party of John Kennedy, the party of Robert Kennedy, the party of FDR and Harry Truman. You say that you're a Democrat, um, but you're getting a lot of support from a, a lot of leading voices on the right, like Steve Bannon, Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, former President Donald Trump. Many Democrats fear that you're a spoiler in the race, that you will damage President Biden in the primary and grease the skids for former President Trump to return to the Oval Office. This week, former President Trump said about you, Kennedy is smart and he's a common sense guy. What kind of man do you think Donald Trump is? Well, you know, here's what I'm not going to do in this race. 
I'm not going to ta attack other people per personally. I don't think it's good for our country. And I think, you know, what I'm trying to do in this race is bring people together, is to try to bridge the divide between Americans. My father was able to harness these populist energies. In the last day of his life, he won the most rural state in this country, South Dakota, and the most urban. He was able to bridge the divide among people who would otherwise be Republican, but wanted somebody who was common sense, who was able to appeal to their idealism, who was able to find the hero in each of them, who was able to get them to transcend narrow self-interest and see themselves as part of a community and part of this you know, incredible American adventure in, in modeling self-governance for the rest of the world. And so I'm proud that President Trump likes me, even though I don't agree with him on most of his issues. I'm, because I don't want to alienate people. I want to bring people together. I'm proud that all these people like me and that I have independent supporters and Democratic supporters and that I'm able to bring a lot of people. You know, every Democrat says, I want to end the polarization. But how do you do that without talking to people who don't agree with you? How do you do that without appealing to people? Without the per My purpose is to find the issues, the values that we have in common, rather than, you know, focus on the issues and the personalities but that keep us all apart. As a lifelong Democrat, as you just said very passionately, will you pledge to support whoever the dom Democratic nominee is, whoever it is, whether it's you, whether it's President Biden? Oh, I, of course I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No, of course I'm not. I'm not so I listen. If you don't get the nomination, you won't support President Biden. I don't know what I'll do. Let's see how the Demo let's see what happens in this campaign. Let's see, you know, what if if people are living up to democratic values and having debates and having discussions and, you know, talking to each other, but I'm not going to buy And if you feel that's not happening, would you then support a, a Republican uh, or gonna, run as I, an independent? I'm not, you know what? My plan is to win this election and I don't have a plan B. Okay. You're a lifelong Democrat and yet so many Republicans are supporting you and I'm sure when you gave that number about how much money you've gotten in campaign contributions, a lot of it is coming from Republicans. They're interested in you advancing to a debate with Joe Biden, which doesn't look like it's gonna happen. I mean, we're gonna try to get the president debate. We think it's really important. Um, I, you know, and it's important for, the, for, I think, the Democratic Party because ultimately the president is going to have to debate a Republican and the Republican likely, oh, we don't know, but is going to be Trump. Trump is probably the most successful debater in this country since Lincoln Douglas in the way that he dispatched 16 Republican opponents one after the other during, you know, in 2016 was really quite extraordinary and he has his own technique that people like. And uh, and it's like going to a prize fight, and and uh, you need practice. Sure. And that usually happens during the primary. And asking you know the president not to debate during the primary is like asking a prize fighter to you know to, to practice for his big bout by, by sitting on a couch and eating right. Chick Fil A. It's interesting <laughs> that you're saying that and praising him because you normally don't hear that from a candidate who's, who could potentially run against him. Are you learning? Did you learn through this campaign what your father taught you, what your uncle taught you, what Donald Trump has taught you? Well, about what? Just about how to run a campaign. Uh, well, I've got very good, uh, I have a very good staff running this campaign. You met Dennis Kucinich, who is my, uh, my campaign manager, and he's running 42 campaigns. Former Fox News contributor. He's nodding his exactly. head. Yes, he's doing a good job. <laughs> right, right on camera there. I have never seen spirit like there is right now. Even coming down here, just at the people on the road that are just absolutely going crazy. And the reason is... Yeah, I think they like me, and I, I know they love my policies. I hope they like me, too. You know, a lot of people say they don't like me, but they like my I think they like me. But I have never seen spirit like it is right now. And the reason is because crooked Joe Biden is so bad. He's the worst president in the history of our country. I don't think he's going to make it to the gate, but, you know, you never know. But Joe is really... But you don't think he's going to make it? to November of 24th. Well, I think he's worse uh, mentally than he is physically, and physically he's not exactly uh, a triathlete or any kind of an athlete. You look at him, he can't walk to the helicopter. He, he walks, 
He can't lift his feet out of the grass. You know, it's only two inches at the White House, right? That's not a lot. But you watch him, and it looks like he's walking on toothpicks. He's supposed to be getting us out of that horrible, horrible war that we're very much involved in with Russia and Ukraine. You could do that. You could do that very easily. I believe you could do that very I don't believe he could do it because he's just incompetent. But that's a war that should end immediately, not because of one side or the other, because hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Can you imagine you're in an apartment house and rockets are going into that building and blowing it up and knocking it down? And who, who can, why, why should anything, why should anybody, human beings, these are human, whether they're Russian or Ukrainian or whatever they are, it's gotta be stopped. And it can't be stopped very easily. It would have never started, if I were president, it would have never started. So just back to Biden, I'm interested. So you think he's failing. He obviously is failing. I think it's clear to everybody. But that would make Kamala Harris the candidate? Well, not really. I mean, I guess they'd have uh, maybe a free-for-all. A lot of people say she has to remain for certain reasons, the candidate. She has to. I don't think that's true, actually. I don't think that other people would stand for it. Uh, she has some bad moments. Her moments are almost as bad as his. I think his are worse, actually. Yeah. But she seems pretty senile, too. She speaks in, uh, in rhyme. You know, it's weird. It's weird. But she has bad moments. And in rhyme? What do you well, the way she talks, the bus will go here, and then the bus will go there, because that's what buses do. And it's weird. The whole <laughs> thing is weird. This is not a president of the United States future. And uh, I think they probably have some kind of a primary, and other people will get involved. I mean, Newsom, right? I could mean, that's... be, could be. I mean, you know, I always got along well with him, believe it or not. But could be him, could be somebody else. You know, it's very hard to take on the Democrat Party. Look at RFK Jr. They're not giving him the vote. I mean, they're saying you have to get a, a vast number of votes in order to even qualify. They're making it impossible for him. You know, they're essentially rigging the election, which they're very good at. You know, you've got a Republican mega donor funding one of your main super PACs. You've got Ron DeSantis saying he'd put you in his cabinet. Key allies of Donald Trump are saying they want you to be Trump's running mate. Why are you Republicans' favorite Democrat? Well, you know, I started out this campaign saying that I wanted to end the toxic polarization that is dividing America. That has... Uh, that I think is as dangerous as any time since the American Civil War. And, you know, I, a lot of people agree with that. A lot of Americans agree with that. They talk about the future in ap apocalyptical terms because of the division and don't see where there's a good end. And I feel like somebody needs to stand up and stop talking so much, focusing so much on the issues that divide us and talk instead about the values that bring us together. And I will talk anybody. You know, I'm happy to talk to uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I'm not, I don't attack either of them personally. I talk about their issues critically. Uh, for Democratic voters, when they hear that a Republican is funding one of your PACs, maybe that gives them pause. Well, but uh, he's not the only funder of my PAC. And, and but he's a big I got one. A, Well, yeah, but I've got ones that are equally big or Democrats. So I think that's a good thing. RFK Jr. all of a sudden becoming a, a thing. Now, very interesting because Joe Biden, it looks like he's losing his facilities. He looks like he's falling apart. He can't remember where he is, can't remember numbers, what day it is. RFK Jr. comes on and he puts this thing out over the weekend and he's jacked. He's in great shape and he's 69 years old. Talk to us a little bit about, do you think you will face Joe Biden in, in a general election in 2024? I don't know whether or not he makes it to the gate. Um, I don't. I really can't tell you that. That's really the question. Will he make it to the starting gate? Uh, he obviously there's some. He's got some problems. Some very big problems physically, mentally. I don't know. I mean, you tell me. Is he going to make it to the starting gate? But you know, they'll come up with somebody. I will say RFK Jr., who I've known not very well, but I've known for a while, and I respect him. A lot of people respect him. He's got some uh, some very important points to be made. No, he's a respected person. Should, he's a should they debate? 22, I saw it just now. Should, should they debate, and sir? That's a lot for somebody that came in with absolutely no chance of winning. Should totally they debate? A lot. Would you serve in a, in a GOP administration, given the number of Republicans who 
actively support you and support your policies, it, I could see a scenario where you could possibly serve on either side. Is that possible? I, I, I would doubt it, but I, um, you know, I'm not looking to get into government except if I can actually fix the government. And I think the, you know, one place that I can do that from is the presidency. And there's no other option for you to do that? I know that you don't have a plan I, B at the I, moment. I, would not, I definitely would not welcome that. And I, I, I you know, I'm not going to say that would never happen if, you know, but it would, I would never be happy even, you know, I would never be happy doing something like that. If you're talking about if somebody out, you know, hypothetically um, offered me to run EPA, you know, or HHS, would I do it? Probably not, but, you know, I'm not gonna make, absolutely you, say not, but I, it's not why I'm running. I, I'm intending to I win understand. and I wouldn't want to. You would be such a powerful force in the EPA given your background, I, I'd be surprised I bet a lot of people would welcome you in that role, but of course we are talking about the presidency right now. Should, should Biden and RFK debate, should Biden have a, a Democrat debate? The Democrats don't want to put him up for a debate because I guess they're afraid he, he'll look weaker than he actually is. Well, I don't think, or I, don't, I just don't think that they'll allow him to debate anybody. I mean, you could put up a child, I don't think they'll allow him to debate. Uh, okay. They're not gonna allow it to happen. As a lifelong Democrat, are you worried that you will be taking 10, maybe 20 percent of Biden's votes? I hope to take votes, votes from both <laughs> President Biden and President Trump. An equal look opportunity. At this, look at the stats that shows you uh, you have 48 percent approval with Republicans and you have about 14 percent approval with Democrats. So you, Donald Trump's going to look at you as a threat if he does, in fact, get the nomination. Are you ready for him to come after you? Yeah, I'm, you know, I... I feel like I have my own moral center and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage in the bitter, you know, the bitterness. I, I hope Donald Trump will, will, uh, will dispute me on the issues and that we can all talk about the issues that affect America and what's ha America, what's happening to the middle class, the destruction, systematic destruction of the middle class. Do you agree on that? I, yeah, there are areas of agreements and there's areas that I have agreement with President Biden. So, I, you know, I, I I think people are tired of the vitriol and I'm not going to engage in that. Sure. Absolutely. This isn't a prosecution. This is a persecution. Uh, it, it, it's really a sad day in American politics that you have the Department of Justice that has targeted our former president. Uh, and, and the idea that you have a sitting president who's taken bribes from Ukraine, and we've got bank account numbers, we've got transactions, and nothing's being done. And so that's why I dropped the articles of impeachment against Biden. And enough is enough. The American people, uh, quite frankly, are going to elect uh, President Trump to be the next president of the United States. And I don't think Biden will even be uh, the Democratic nominee. Oh, you think Robert F. Kennedy is going to be the nominee? <laughs> Well, we'll see. Uh, I, I think the, 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 uh, the vultures are circling, if you will. I, I think you see a lot of uh, Democrats not saying anything to defend Biden, and I think that's an indicator that they're waiting for the next shoe to drop, and he, he will not be the nominee. This is going to be Trump. This is Trump's uh, primary to win. This is Trump's general election to win, and the latest polling data shows that. If, if Carrie Lake's not President Trump's VP, I, I, if that's not the selection, you could do a lot better in a coalition ticket of Trump and Kennedy, right? I'm just not sure I want to run against anybody else. I sort of like this one. And by the way, we're leading him by a lot. But just think. I've been repeatedly asked whether I would be, uh, whether I'd consider being Donald Trump's vice presidential pick, and I would not. But in any GOP administration, uh, would you serve cabinet, anything like that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Have you seen the Trump mugshot? Yeah, I did see it. What would you think? It was a, an interesting and probably very shrewd decision for him to put on that very defiant face. 
I think it's very popular with his base. Do you think the mugshot appeals to the Democrat base in any way? I had a mugshot when I, I was a resident in Puerto Rico in 2001 when I was doing a protest against the Navy on a lawsuit that I eventually won that got the Navy out of Vieques. But when you're a resident and you get the mugshot, you have a strategic decision about whether how you want to look. I wondered whether he practiced it in front of a mirror or whether he was just angry at the time and that reflected what he did. But I, I thought from a strategic point of view, it worked very well for him. Well, joining us to share her thoughts is former Arizona gubernatorial candidate, former broadcaster Carrie Lake. She's just written and released her first book out this week, Unafraid, Just Getting Started. Carrie, it's good to talk with you. Steve Bannon said this week that Robert Kennedy Jr. would be an excellent choice as Donald Trump's vice presidential candidate. So what are your thoughts on that? Go with a Democrat? Well, I think it's funny, you know, it shows that we're really, we're almost beyond Democrat versus Republican. We are now communism and globalism versus Americanism. And I've been hearing the, uh, you know, fake news media attacking Robert Kennedy Jr., calling him a MAGA Democrat. I mean, they just don't want outsiders in the political machine. They don't want outsiders coming into the swamp and draining the swamp, whether they be outsiders who are Democrats or outsiders who are Republican. They want just the pre-approved, controllable, easily blackmailed, easily bribed people like Joe Biden and the whole swamp system down there. Uh, I think uh, Robert F. Kennedy has done amazing things. His book is incredible, exposing Dr. Fauci and the fraud that he is. And I think he's an incredible man. I don't believe with uh, in a lot of, of what he espouses. I think um, ideologically, politically, we have many differences. And I think that he and President Trump probably do as well. But I do believe that President Trump most likely respects RFK Jr. and vice versa. Well, that's because he's a, a anti-deep state. Oh, you know, no country can survive if it can't. If it, if it can't control its borders, and we're not doing that. The good news is this, that everybody that I talked to there said that this is easy to stop. That the way to stop it is very, very simple, and that they've been doing it before. Now, I didn't like to hear this because I don't, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump. I did not like his wall. But what the Border Patrol and the, everybody else said is, you don't need to build a physical barrier from San Diego, 2,200 miles to Brownsville, Texas. You do need a physical barrier in certain places where there's high density populations. The rest of it you can monitor with, uh, with ground monitoring, very, very sophisticated surveillance and ground monitoring systems. Many of those were put up during the Trump administration, but for some reason, the Biden administration, when it came in, took down the towers and they remove the ground sensing systems. This is not something that, as a Democrat, that I want to hear. And, and then, you know, once it got out that this is an open border and the, the cartels saw that there's a huge profit um, opportunity here, uh, the, the flow has just increased exponentially. And, but we can stop it. During the Trump administration, the crossings at Humor were about 10 to 25 a day at most. Now, as I said, they're, you know, they're 200 to 800 a day. So, you know, we can solve this problem, but you know, we need to do it in a way that's sensible, that's common sense, and that, uh, that is not causing this terrible, terrible humanitarian crisis. Uh, from where I sat on the border, there's a tree that you can see on the other side of the fence, but it's in U.S. territory. It's called the rape tree. And it's where the cartels extract their final payment from women who come across, sometimes from children, uh, the, the Border Patrol watches helplessly why they do this. I talked to people, you know, this Peruvian family that I talked to that had lost their life savings because the, the, the cartels robbed them, they beat them, they extort them, they exploit them, and ultimately they raped them. And, you know, this is a humanitarian crisis that we, uh, that, uh, you know, that we're creating through government negligence, and we need to end it for everybody's sake. Why do you think that our government could be involved in oh, well, this evidence? Oh, well, you know, listen, when, 
The Warren Commission, obviously, which was run by Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, who my uncle fired, found that it was a lone shooter, which was Lee Harvey Oswald. But when Congress, a congressional committee, reinvestigated between 1977 and 1979 the House Select Assassinations Committee, they concluded, and, and they saw a lot more documentation and had a lot more witnesses than the Warren Commission ever saw, they concluded that my uncle was killed by a, a conspiracy. And the, most of the people, for example, Richard Schweitzer, who was the first the head of the committee, publicly said, uh, JFK, John, the President of the United States, was that the CIA was involved in the murder of the President of the United States. And that's a quotation. Most of the people on that committee at that time believed it was the CIA, that it was believed certain pe people in the CIA. You were, you were seven at the time? Seven or eight? I was, uh, I was 10 when my uncle was ten killed. Uncle I was 14 when my father was killed. Oh, no. uh, um, you know, the, and today there is overwhelming evidence. I mean, in fact, why don't the it was, it was government just, needs to know, release the, all of the files on it and let it let, be transparent. Let us see the information. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. There's still, you know, the, the law requires, there, you know, there's a law that requires that all the records of John Kennedy's assassination be released to the public 10 years ago. So they're still holding 5,000 documents. President Biden promised when he was elected that he was going to release those documents. President Trump promised that he would. But the CIA doesn't want them to. And so the question that I think Americans have a right to ask, including members of, you know, my father and uncle's family, is why not? What is it that you don't want to see 60 years later? And by the way, the last... You know, the last... The last, tran the last tranche of documents released um, had documentation in there that finally got even the New York Times to admit that Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA asset, that he was working for the CIA. So, um, and Ameri if the Warren Commission had known that back in, in you know, 1964, they would have had a very different time. And the House Assassinations Committee never knew that. Mm -hmm. That was released, um, you know, we've known that, that we've had documentation, that have known that at least a decade. But some of that documentation became overwhelming in this last tranche, and finally the mainstream media acknowledged that, yeah, he had this relationship with the CIA going back to 1957 or 1958. Three quarters of Americans believe that President Biden is too old to govern effectively. President Trump faces multiple civil and criminal trials. Both of them have favorability ratings that are deep in negative territory. That's what two-party politics has given us. And that's why we need to pry loose from the hammerlock of the corrupt powers in Washington, D.C. and make this nation ours again. But there's a sacrifice that everyone, including myself, have to make if we're going to reunite America. We're going to have to surrender the kind of political addiction that is ultimately at the root of all of these divisions. And that's the addiction to taking sides. Our nation's renewal is going to begin when we start to treat each other with respect. Only then will we be able to step outside our tired, stuck debates. We can ask the questions then that nobody thought to ask. We can discover solutions that were right in front of our face. We will listen not just to the other side, but to those who are apart from any side. In a two-sided conflict, both parties have a kind of mutual dependency. Each side depends on the other to define themselves as good guys in contrast to the other side, who, of course, are the bad guys. Well, if you're a team good, then you'll do anything, no matter how unscrupulous, to defeat team evil. And that's why we've seen both parties sacrificing their core values and the, and the foundational canons of democracy in an all-out power for, power for, in an all-out struggle for power. 
In a war against evil, any means justifies the end. The result is that we ourselves become evil if we participate in that battle. The child who is obsessed with hating a parent becomes that parent. As I've surrendered my attachment to taking sides over the past six months, I've been able to listen with new ears to people with whom I disagree and to see solutions that would otherwise have been invisible. I'll give you an example. Six months ago, I thought that an open border was a humanitarian policy and that sealing, if you were for sealing the border, it meant that you were probably a xenophobe and maybe a racist. I was wrong. How did I learn I was wrong? It wasn't just that I listened. It, it wasn't just that I listened to the other side. It was when I actually visited the border and listened to people who weren't on either side. My views changed as I spoke to Border Patrol officers, to local officials, to local sheriffs, to aid workers, and to the migrants themselves. I saw that no one party has a monopoly on wisdom, and none of the simplistic narratives actually contain the whole truth. My promise to you as president is that I'm going to do this on every issue. I'm going to listen to the stakeholders. <laughs> I'm going to listen to the stakeholders from every side and beyond any side. I'm going to uphold my moral convictions, of course, absolutely. But I'll hold my own opinions lightly. If it's not him, who's it going to be? He's also the most corrupt mm. president in history, without question. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Uh, there'll be a fight. I don't think that Kamala gets it handed. You know, a lot of people are so afraid to go against her. I don't think it gets handed. I think all of a sudden everybody would start jumping in. She'd have to earn it. It'd be very hard to earn. Uh, but I don't know. You know, they're the same five or six people that you report on and you Michelle see all Obama. the time. I don't see that, no. no. I don't see it, no. Gavin Newsom? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. You announced in Philadelphia that you're going to run for president as an independent. You're from one of the most famous Democratic families of all time. How big a step was it to say, you know what, uh, today, sorry family, I'm going to have to take a step away? It was very painful for me. I mean, I, you know, I was raised in the Democratic Party. My father, my uncles were the leaders of the party, my great uh, grandfather Honey Fitz was the first Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. My other great grandfather Patrick Kennedy was a ward boss with the Democratic Party in Boston. Uh, I think it's the right thing right now because we're seeing that, you know, it's the same corporate donors that control both of the parties. And the parties are in paralysis. They cannot, within that party system, they're locked in this, in this war with each other and they're polarizing the American public and we need uh, we need a strategy for unity and we need a strategy for bringing people together and what I've found traveling the country even among the most extreme Democrats and Republicans there's still more that we have in common than than the issues that are being used to drive us apart everybody wants a clean environment everybody wants to take care of our veterans everybody wants our kids to have a good education everybody wants to make sure the regulatory agencies are serving the public interest instead of working for the corporations that they're supposed to regulate and I think we need somebody who's gonna find those areas of agreement, the values we agree on, rather than focus on these little issues that have us at each other's throats. And Ted Kennedy, believe it or not, was a friend of mine. I met him through Palm Beach. They had a big house, a compound. They call it the Kennedy Compound. And I had a very nice house also. But I got to know him very well, and he liked me. And at one time I asked him, Who's the smartest guy in the U.S. Senate? He was a smart guy, by the way, Ted Kennedy, very smart, great politician. And I said, who's the smartest guy in the Senate? And we were friends. I did him a big favor, I will tell you that. Big, big favor, really big. And it wasn't hard for me to do, but it was very big and important for him. And he liked me, and I liked him. I said, who's the smartest in the Senate? And I'll, he gave me a name, but I won't tell you, because I, I can't stand the guy, actually. Still around. Can't stand him. 
I was disappointed to hear that day. I said, who's the dumbest in the Senate? He goes, I don't know. Let's see. Probably Joe. I said, who's Joe? He said, Joe Biden. Can you, this is, this is 25, 30 years ago, a long time ago. I think it was one of the early times I've ever heard the name. And that was in prime time for him. But this is in prime time. Joe gave us the war on Israel and the war on American energy. What he did to our energy was we were energy independent. Think of it as president, I will shut off Iranian oil and I will turn on American oil and we will drill, baby, drill, and we'll get things back to where they are supposed to be. I've dealt so uh, intimately with these regulatory agencies. Usually when a politician comes into office in Washington, they vow to clean up the swamp. But they get there and they're intimidated by these agencies that may have 30,000 or 50,000 employees and they have no idea how to reform them. So they bring in somebody to run that agency, somebody who is safe, which is usually somebody from industry. So President Trump promised to reform Washington, but he came into office saying, I'm going to, you know, even he even talked about medicine and about vaccines and these kinds of things. He then took a million dollars from Pfizer and he appointed a Pfizer partner, Scott Gottlieb, to run FDA. And, and another Pfizer handpicked nominee, Alex Azar, right from the middle of the pharmaceutical industry to run HHS. And Gottlieb then ushered through the Pfizer product and made $88 billion for his company and then left FDA to rejoin the Pfizer board. That's not ending the swamp. That is making the swamp even deeper. And I know, I know when I go in there how to fix DOT, how to fix HHS, NIH, CDC, EPA, all of the three later agencies because I've litigated against them and I've been thinking for 40 years, how do you unravel corporate capture at these agencies? And I know how to do it. I know how to, re, uh, to, to, uh, um, to reorganize those agencies, to end the revolving doors, to end these financial entanglements with the industries they're supposed to regulate. And in many cases, I know the specific individuals in those agencies who need to be moved out. And that's why I think I'm in better shape than anybody else to, to reform, to get the kind of reforms that the American people want. Yeah, I was fed up too. And that's why I'm running for president of the United States as an independent. I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I approve this message. I'll look at the evidence and the arguments, and I'll choose not the easy path, not the established path, but the right path. In making an independent run for president, I take inspiration from the one other president who, who did not have a political party, and that president was George Washington. And his, In his farewell address, Washington issued a prescient warning about the disastrous potential of party politics. Inevitably, he said, political parties will be taken over by a cunning, ambitious, unprincipled minority who will serve the interests of the party rather than the interests of the nation and usurp for themselves the reins of government. Washington's dire prediction has certainly come true. I intend to wrest the reins of both parties and return power to the American people.